Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brother James. I greet you once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is our 11th lesson on the biblical doctrine of the rapture. We are discussing the many, many, many reasons why the rapture of the church pertains, well, to the church, and the great tribulation pertains to the nation of Israel, and why never the twain shall meet. Today we want to consider this. The Old Testament states frequently that Israel passes through the tribulation because of two awful sins. First, their ages-long affinity for worshiping idols rather than God, and their rejection and killing of their Messiah. Now, you might remember, and if, if you don't, let me read it to you, and once you hear it, you'll never forget it. While standing at the foot of the cross, as the Lord of glory shed his precious blood to pay for the sins of sinners, at the foot of that cross, the representative heads of the nation of Israel said, his blood be on us and on our children. What a chilling statement. And in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, the Lord himself said in verse number 37, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. To whom was he speaking? Verse 34, O generation of vipers, mm, the devil's offspring, God's chosen people, the devil's offspring. Wow, what a, what a terrible situation. So this is the next reason we can cite as proof the church will not be on earth for the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel's tribulation is due in large part to their rejection of Jesus Christ and in large part to their idolatry. And save born-again Christians neither have idols in their buildings or in their homes or in their yards. <laughs> and they certainly haven't rejected the Lord Jesus Christ or they wouldn't be save born-again Christians. The prophet Zechariah, had much to say about the future of the nation of Israel. In Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, he refers to the Lord's entry into Jerusalem as he rode upon the colt just one week prior to his death. Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a, an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And you know that was uh, fulfilled just exactly as uh, God said it would be in the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. Second, in Zechariah 11, we have the mention of Judas' act in selling his master for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11 and verse number 12, And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Again, that prophecy has been Fulfilled. Then Zechariah 12 moves forward to the future day when Israel shall look upon him whom they pierced and mourn because of him. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10 says, And I will, uh, well, start at verse 9, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, 
and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. So what do we have? Somebody pierced Jesus Christ. Somebody's going to pay for that in Megiddo. Somebody is going to feel terribly about that in Jerusalem. Now I got to tell you something. Christ died for my sins, but I did not pierce him. He was, he was put to death on order from the leaders of the nation unto whom he came, and he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Revelation 1, 7, you, you remember, alludes to this saying, Behold, he cometh the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. They shall recognize that the one they rejected and crucified was indeed their Messiah and their King. Zechariah 13 verse 7 hearkens back to the death of our Lord and mentions the subsequent suffering of Israel among the nations of the world. But God will bring a third part of them through the fire which is none other than the fiery trial of the great tribulation. Look at verse number nine. And I will bring, no, uh, in fact, verse, let's go back to verse seven. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd. That's Jesus Christ at his crucifixion. And the sheep shall be scattered. And hasn't that, Jew been sent to the far ends of the earth. Now you say, well, I, I don't think that's that, that sheep there. That's not a reference to the nation of Israel. Really? Really? He said, I'm the good shepherd. He called them unto him. He, he offered to lead them into green pastures. They said, no, no, away with this man. They crucified him. What will be the result? I will turn mine hand upon the little ones, and it shall come to pass. Then all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, and I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. When? Now look. His people rejected him. They crucified him. They're going, two-thirds are going to die. They're going to go through the fire. And when they finally get through the fire, they're going to call on the Lord. And Romans 11 says, when they do, they'll be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then Zechariah 14 makes, uh, uh, by the way, by the way, that Zechariah 13, the fact that this is mentioned in direct connection with their crucifixion of Christ suggests again that their tribulation is God's dealing with them in judgment because of this terrible crime. Now Zechariah 14 verses 2 to 5 makes reference to Christ's second coming when his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem shall then be delivered and the Lord shall reign over all the earth. Take a look, Zechariah 14, 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives." which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Verse number nine. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day 
shall there be one Lord and his name one. Since all this has only Israel in view, the plain interpretation is that the church is not here during this tribulation time. Now, if you want all of these passages in detail, we have a book available that the Lord helped me to write. It's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the book of Zechariah, and I would highly recommend that to you and encourage you uh, to uh, get yourself a copy of that and to enjoy it. We note next that the church does not pass through the tribulation because... While many signs are given, both in the Old and the New Testaments, to precede the coming of Christ that is appearing, no signs are suggested anywhere to usher in or to establish a time for the rapture of the church. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 1.22, we are told that the Jews require a sign. We're also told that Looking for signs is in itself an evidence of unbelief. Jesus said to those who did not trust him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye shall not believe, John 4, 48. So believers don't look for signs. Believers don't need signs, and believers aren't given signs. The church's path is one entirely of faith, including the hope of his return. No signs are given for Jesus catching away his church. In fact, the very opposite is stressed. For example, in Luke 21, verses 27 to 28. Luke 21, verses 27 through 28, the Lord said, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The Jews were told they could know when their redemption was near because they would see certain things. By contrast, Romans 8, written to save born-again Christians, the people who will go up in the rapture, says in verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The language is strong, and the difference is clear. Israel looks to see things, the church by faith, not sight, waits for Christ. All signs in Scripture have to do with Israel or the world. None have to do with the church. You know, the danger in looking for and looking at signs is that the eye is taken off the Lord. When one begins to look for signs instead of the Savior, one starts looking around instead of looking up. As a consequence, heavenly mindedness is lost. When the child of God looks to current events and news reports, depression, fear, anger, false doctrine, carnality, seem to always be the result. When the child of God is living each day in anticipation of meeting Jesus in the air, holiness results. Remember 1 John 3, 3? Now, there are many signs to indicate the second coming of Christ is drawing near, with Matthew 24 containing the most well-known collection. If the church were to pass through the tribulation, all of the abominations to watch and be ready, and uh, not ad abominations, all the admonitions to watch and be ready and to anticipate the Lord's return would be, well, they'd be silly. No one could have any hope of the coming of Jesus until they'd watched the signs unfold and watched the Antichrist work his ministrations of death. 
Alas, uh, this is what so many prophecy preachers and teachers, falsely so-called, have persuaded countless Christians to do. Uh, Save men and women are watching for earthquakes or wars or pestilences or, or guess the Antichrist, name the Antichrist, find the beast. Instead of looking for Jesus, countless ridiculous and foolish prophecies have been made because of this fundamental error. You ought to see the books I have or have had in my library describing and declaring Bismarck to the Antichrist. Napoleon is the Antichrist. Mussolini is the Antichrist. Hitler is the Antichrist. Stalin, Ronald Reagan, a dozen different popes, Saddam Hussein, Bill Clinton, Barack Barry Hussein Sotero Obama, and many more have all been proven someone's antichrist. Why do people do this? Why do they get it so wrong? Because they're not looking for Jesus Christ, looking for the Lord from glory. They're looking for the antichrist to rise up in the earth. If the church were looking for Jesus Christ instead of for a false Christ, they would have never fallen into so many hurtful snares. Now, to follow up on this, let's consider one more point. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until the Lord has taken his church home to heaven. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, read as follows. 2 Corinthians I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Let no man deceive you by any means. That's a command. For that day shall not come except there come a falling way first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination of which Daniel spoke. Remember ye not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. I, I, I feel sure that Most Bible students agree that the one who sits in the temple of God claiming to be God is none other than the Antichrist. This Antichrist cannot be revealed while one is here to hinder his manifestation. Having considered other interpretations on this portion, and I've read scores of books, I'm not exaggerating, scores of books on Revelation. And having considered them all, it still remains clear to me that there's only one person strong enough to hinder the awful development of the full-blown apostasy described here. That one is the Lord Jesus Christ in his body, the church, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The one of whom it was said by Jesus that the gates of hell would not prevail against it Matthew 16, verse 18. This body of Christ must first be taken out of the way before Antichrist can come. All of this, all of this calls for the removal of the church by her Lord in the rapture. The tribulation cannot begin until after the blessed hope has become a blessed reality. Praise be to the Lord for that. Okay, we're going to stop right there on this particular program. We have three, sometimes more, sermons and Bible studies a week that are going up on our YouTube channel. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Bible teaching sermons and lessons like this one are available 
for your edification, your instruction, and your enjoyment. When you subscribe to our channel, it helps us help you and it helps us help others. When you pray for us, it helps us to keep on going. And we really thank you and really appreciate that. Until next time, I'm Brother James. May the Lord richly bless you and good day.